Um, hi. So um, my name is Soda. So um, I know the um, talk description says that I'll be talking about lessons from uh, document production. But after I did out the slides, um, I realized actually the topic that's more appropriate is about single host deployment. So um, I, I am currently working as a software engineer at the Ministry of Education in Singapore. So um, we've been using Docker for about two years now. Um, last year, around this time, I also gave a talk at Honestbee um, on our experience of using Docker and Ruby on Rails. So to some extent, this is an extension of that talk about what, what we have learned collectively um, since, the last, since the last one year. Um, and our focus really is, so um, as I go into more talk, you'll understand more about um, different, uh, what single host deployment and what's custard deployment. And for our use case, we kind of use, we kind of stuck on a single host deployment for a while. And so we have some lessons learned from there that can help you translate into um, a cluster setup, for instance. So, um, so okay, just a quick terminology check with everybody, so everybody know what the hell is going on, right? So, um, a Docker file is a specification of your image. It's like a, you can treat of it. You can think of it as a source code from which you can build for the, uh, your image on. Your image is a snapshot of your application environment that is described by the Docker file, and then after which you take this Docker image and you run it as a Docker container which is actually a runtime. So if you think about it, it's like a source code and your binary and then your process. So that's just, that's just, that's just a basic idea of what, um, what Docker is and, 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 and stuff. So, so now I'm going to talk about deployment methods. So now you've, got, you've been through the process of creating your own images and you want to find a way to deploy them, right? So the next question to ask is how do you actually deploy these images um, and what are the ways that you can actually deploy them? So um, I'll first talk about clustered deployment. So basically you have a bunch of machines um, uh, that's, that's capable of running containers. You hook them up with some form of orchestrator. So you can think of like your Docker Swarm as an orchestrator or your Kubernetes or your Mesos that will link all your um, physical uh, machines up together. And then you say that, okay, now orchestrator, please run one container uh, of my application. And then it fits it into one of the hosts that's there. And then you say, I want to run another, another uh, container and then you will put it in another host. So from the container perspective, right, um, they can talk to each other as in the, the, even though they are on physically different machines, you can still access the containers as though they are on one single uh, network, even though they are separated physically by a host. So that's how uh, your communities will have their own overlay network that manages the traffic uh, between the containers. So this is uh, basically your uh, typical custard setup, right? Um, the, the dash line actually represents that the traffic that actually flows doesn't flow directly through uh, the processes. But actually, the orchestration overlay network will take care of that routing for you. But from the perspective of a container, it will seem as if you're talking directly to the other container, even though they could be somewhere else on a host. So what is a single host deployment? So if you take that clustered idea and you say, I just, I just only have uh, resources to manage one single host, um, well, maybe you can have resources to manage two single hosts. You will then put containers onto the uh, physical host. But the, the challenge that you'll face at this point is that you cannot have the containers talk to each other directly. So they will have to go through the host level networking to assess it. So uh, the typical setup, uh, I mean, if you do Docker tutorial, they ask you to do uh, dash P80 colon 80, and then you can access the port 80 on your local machine, right? So that's actually doing a network translation layer between your host machine and the container. So the communication between the containers have to go through the physical host, which is the difference. So how about orchestration on a single host deployment setup, right? So there is which is actually your system, optical system admin, right? So he will, he will say, you know what, I'm going to put um, this, this, this container that you have on this particular host, and then he will manage this independently from, so there's, there's, no, there's no, really no real magic that's going on um, in a single host deployment setup. So the question then comes, why would you want to do a single host deployment if a clustered solution is available to you, right? So um, at this point, I just want to say that a cluster deployment, as much as, the ben as, as much as it gives you a lot of benefits, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of overhead to actually run such a uh, clustered setup. So if you are a small startup that's thinking of trying to do something quick, you might not want to pay the overhead of actually deployment this. I mean, now, nowadays we have like all the, doc like what Vincent has said earlier about um, Docker, Docker Swarm on the web with AWS. Yeah, that you lets you go straight to the cloud, but still, it is, it is a cost that is an engineering cost that you have to think about when you want to do this this, this sort of deployment. So um, single host deployment still remains very easy, and this is this will be the main part of what 
I've been doing, so I can, I can share some of my experience dealing with it. But we will now, for my side, we eventually got to move away from this and do a more custom setup. So, so yeah. So uh, before I talk about deployments, I want to move the conversation back a bit about development process. So um, my thoughts about using Docker for development, um, I will not run through them again, but I think it's a bad idea in general. Um, but still, in certain use cases, it is very useful to have Docker um, there to let you develop against. So I will explain to you what it means, right? So if you have your application dependencies, so if you think about a typical application now, you have a Rails application, for instance, that talks to a certain API server, and then API server talks to a certain database, and then you have some other dependencies. So Docker is very good at managing these dependencies of your applications. So um, you, can you can containerize the API server and your database and your Redis, but on your dev, when you're actually doing your development, um, right now, I, I don't think they're there yet, but what we, would, what we advise our developers to do is actually to install the entire development stack on your machine instead of having a containerized setup just because of the tooling. So if you disagree with me, you can try and talk to me after this, but I, but I, feel, I feel very strongly about the benefits and cost of doing certain things. So this is the setup that we do. So the next question comes, right, when you actually flip the arrow of this setup. So if you're developing for an API server and then you have a Rails application that is containerized, how would the Rails uh, container actually talk to your physical host machine? So if you Google this, <coughs> excuse me, you'll find that there's a GitHub repository that, I mean a GitHub issue that has been there for like years, asking Docker to support a host name that routes back to the host. So you can even think about it, if, if the Docker host maps to the actual physical host machine, this wouldn't be a problem. But there is no such feature that, um, that Docker provides. There's no host name that routes to the physical host machine. So um, what you can do is that you can actually use magic IPs that are hard-coded into Docker. So if you use Linux, then you can run, you can look at a bridge, um, the Docker, Docker Zero bridge your uh, IP address. That would be the IP address that allows you to route from your container to your host. So in a container, if you say, I want to hit this 172.17.0.1 address, you actually route to your host uh, 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 process that's actually listening on your host machine. So if you're on Mac, um, like all things magical, you just have to remember this IP address. And then um, the complexity deals to the way the X-Hive virtual machine works. So I won't get into the details of that. But um, this is how you can actually route from a container to your host machine. So how about how do you use um, Docker in production, right? So how should you deploy a, on a single Docker host? So the, the, the temptation is very big to deploy like, it, like this development, right? So you, know, you, you go through the tutorials, you run Docker, you install Docker, and then you run Docker Compose up, Docker Compose run and stuff. And it's very tempting to say that, hey, you know what? To deploy on a single host, I'm just going to create a new VM. I'm going to install Docker in a VM. I'm going to copy the Compose file inside that VM, and I'm just going to run it as usual. But there is a issue with doing that, mainly uh, your, now you can't treat that particular computation machine as um, ephemeral, right? Like you, you, have, you have data inside that particular machine now. So if that machine goes, you kind of lose uh, your configuration setup on that particular machine. And then you can say you version control it, and you can say you copy the files over the place, but it will just be a mess to manage once this number hits, like even two, right? Even two or three, you have a difficulty trying to sync up all your uh, project files together. So um, there's this little known feature of Docker. I'm not sure whether you guys know it, but it took some time for me to get it. So um, there is this Docker host. So when you install Docker, what you're actually installing is two pieces of Docker, right? One is the Docker CLI, which is the command line interface, and one is the Docker daemon, which will spawn processes. So how, how the CLI talks to the daemon is through a uh, Unix socket. Right, so uh, when you run Docker PS or Docker run dash D nginx, the CLI would go through the Unix socket and then ask the Docker daemon to spin up a container. So that's what basically a Docker host, uh, no, that's, that's basically what happens on your local dev machine. Um, but what you can do is that you can specify using a Docker host environmental variable to tell your CLI to assess another uh, Docker daemon instead. So for instance, in this case, if I have a, another physical server elsewhere, um, I can change a Docker daemon flag to say that expose yourself on a particular port number, 
and then on my, on my CLI client, I can access that Docker host remotely. So any command that I run under ex after I exported the Docker host will let me uh, run that container on a remote machine, even though the files are physically living on my, on my system, right? So the, the downside to doing this right now is that uh, if you expose 2375 on the internet, you're basically asking for trouble, right? Because everybody who knows your 2375 port would then be able to run arbitrary containers on your machine. So what you do is you can generate a set of TLS certificates, right? So you can say that um, uh, uh, basically the client certs, you can only use the client certs to access the server certs. Okay, sorry. You generate a client cert, you generate a server cert, you put a server cert on the server, you put a client cert on the client machine, and then you put you export additional more variables, and then you can then uh, access your Docker daemon securely. So at this point, um, the more the people who have played Docker more will know that I'm actually describing one Docker product, right? So, so um, that Docker product is Docker machine. So that's exactly what Docker machine gives you. But if I were to start off the conversation saying what Docker machine is, you probably wouldn't be able to get to this point, right? So, so what you can do is you run this command after you install Docker machine, and then you have a Docker host that's somewhere, and then you can run your commands on. So the whole point is that I think um, doing, this, doing things this way kind of trains you uh, for eventual deployment on the cluster, because you can't really SSH into a node to run commands anymore. So um, if you were to start off with a Docker host setup, you should start, up, start it off in this manner so that you kind of train yourself once things are ready, you can move your, uh, you can move your apps on a cluster setup. Um, so this is a problem which I shared um, last time and then I have found a better solution to it, so I'm sharing it. So um, if you have a typical Rails application or a Node.js application, um, one thing that you will need to do is that you will generate your assets differently from your production assets. So you will do some form of mimification or uglification to the uh, JS or CSS source files. So uh, in a typical deployment, it's very easy to serve the, it's very easy to put on, to run the Nginx process and serve the static files separately while reverse processing the other requests into your real server. So that's, that, that's like totally uh, normal, right? But when you hit a container setup, you run into, a, you run into an issue, right? Because you, your, your, your Nginx containers doesn't really talk to your Rails. So your assets are generated with your Rails container or your Rails image, but your Nginx doesn't really have access to that files that's, that's living on another image. So you, you can't serve the files across the different um, containers. So uh, one possible solution that you can um, resolve that is that you create a new assets volume, you share the, um, you put all the assets in the assets volume, and then Nginx can then mount that volume and then serve, right? So that's, that's great, right? So that's what we did for a while. Um, and we realized that this solution actually doesn't really scale very well um, in a cluster setup, simply because of the volume uh, trade-off. So the other thing that uh, we found that is really useful for us is that you can use Nginx itself as a caching um, server. So what you do is that you uh, specify on your real set to say that certain cache properties and then on your Nginx, you say that, you know, cache the files that has gone through there. So you incur a one-time cost of having real serve um, your assets, but the subsequent requests will then be cached. And then overall, uh, in a more clustered environment, it will, you will actually, actually scale better than the previous solution that I described. And yeah, so if you do this, it's also generalizable for your single page apps. Question. Right. You don't use any cloud uh, CDN or anything like that? Uh, no. So, so for Cloud CDN, um, what we intend to do is to actually still serve. Um, so it's just basically one, one level above this. Yeah. So our CDN will hit our server, and then, yeah, and then it will serve that out. But, uh, but yeah, this is a, okay. yeah. So uh, if, you, if, you are, if you are doing the new in things now with React.js and single page app stuff, right? So basically, this idea is trans uh, transferable to that as well. So after you output your single page app, you will be thinking, what do you do with the files? that are there, right? So just shove it inside uh, Nginx, or if you like some Golang, some, if you write Go, it's pretty trivial to write a static file server on that, and then just plunk it in, and then, you know, it will work generally, yes. I have another question. In case, I mean, in this case, uh, a lot of times a single page application uses uh, some kind of like push state library to push uh, application state into the, back to the um, 
web web host or From static file server. So, like mm -hmm. in our case, like we're using uh, S3 or buckets or some things like that. It often requires additional configuration. Like if you use nginx, you can you can define uh, certain uh, mm -hmm. paths. Like, do you have any issues like with that with with like single page applications? Uh. I need to get more details on what oh. you're talking about because I'm not very sure. But uh, we actually deployed one single page app, and we haven't faced that issue yet. Okay. So, so maybe we can talk about this a bit later. Right. So, um, yeah. So basically, it's a very short talk. Um, yeah. So uh, if you have any question, you can come to uh, come to me. I'll be happy to chat um, about single host deployment, cluster setup. So, um, I mean, just as a question to the community, right? So, uh, I I think. One issue that we are currently facing now is the issue of image tagging, or how to, or, how spe or more specifically, how to actually tag um, images correctly. So uh, we have a GitHub repository that we commit code to, right? So what we've been doing for a long time is to use the Git SHA to describe a particular image. But we have been realizing that it's not really sufficient to describe that, because if you rebuild an image, you kind of run into the problem of, like, well, I have two um, Git SHA two images tagged with the same git sha, but actually means different thing at different points of time. So, so I mean, this is, this, this, I don't have the answer to that question, but uh, just throwing out there and see that if you guys face any issue with version controlling stuff, you know. Why are two images built from the exact same source code with the exact same git sha different? Right, so what happens is that um, if you, if you have, a, if, for instance, if your image is built on top of an Alpine 3.5 image, and let's say Alpine 3.6 released, right? So you, let's say your master doesn't move as fast, so you kind of want to use the new uh, base, base image. So you rebuild the base image with the same exact same source code, right? But inside your Docker file, do you tag the Alpine that you're based on? Uh, yes. So but your yes. source code changed, so the shy is different? Uh, yes. 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 So you yes. have two different images. Yes, but that is that is a cross version change, right? So if you don't tag, even uh, so, so here's the thing about the difference between the Docker, what the Docker is doing and what community is doing, right? So Docker likes to tag the same image. To, um, so if you pull an Alpine 3.5 image today and you pull an Alpine 3.5 image tomorrow, you might actually get different images. Okay. Because they they, they but the update happens. That comes down to another question. Mm. Because within the Alpine image, there are a couple of binaries and libraries. Yes. Who is responsible for patching and updating the binaries yes. and libraries uh, vulnerabilities? Yes. Uh, the accurate. contract that you are signing is basically, I am using 3.5. That means there's no no breakage between them. But in but to me, that's still the same. Correct. But that's not. But that's but our experience is that's, that's not true. Because we rebuilt. So we, we don't tag it at the, the last point level. So we do 3.5 instead of 3.53. But even even if you do even if you tag it to that, if they, they could update the base image, they, they could update the underlying configuration file while tagging it the same way. So we have run into issue where uh, across the version they removed I think either curl because they say that you know what images are too big we're gonna drop curl, and then all our base image all our images that's built from there suddenly has no curl and then something breaks because of that. Okay. Yeah. So so it's just something to think about. Like I know what community says is that. Uh, your image text should be immutable, like what you say. Like once you tag it, then that is that image. You shouldn't be able to change that tag associated with that other images. But it's just something to think about when you go about doing your stuff. Anybody have experience with tagging images? Anyone? No? Okay. Cool. So any other questions? Mm -hmm. yep. You mentioned earlier you're moving away from single post deployment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, can you share with us the reason why you're Right. The reason why is that, um, yeah, <laughs> that's exactly right. Like I'm this guy right now, and I'm not happy with what I'm doing now. So, <laughs> the, so the, the 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 trouble with single host deployment is that it doesn't scale, right? So right now we have few application, one or two, what team can manage it, right? But essentially, what what's happening here is that when the monitoring says that you know what, one of the processes is dying. This guy has to wake up and make sure <laughs> that the guy spins up, right? So, uh, it, so like I said, if, if you're a small startup and you're trying to prove your idea, then you know what? Don't don't bother with communities unless it's super easy to set up, right? I think if you're a small startup trying to prove your idea, don't bother with containers or anything at all. Just go for Heroku or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I agree. But the thing is that, um, yeah, 
I, I, I agree with what you're saying, but once, if you succeed, then you kind of are running into the process of transitioning. So if you want to minimize the time to transition between stacks, right, like, like if you have a Docker container that's built, you, you're kind of guaranteed that you'll run, whether it's on a single host setup or a, or a, or a Kubernetes or a Mesos, as long as they support images. But if you do a Heroku and you're like, okay, shit, I want to move out of Heroku and, and that's going to be another pain, potentially it could be a pain point. Yep. So what are you going to use? <laughs> um, we're exploring certain, uh, several technologies now. So I think the market leaders right now are Mesosphere and Kubernetes. And I think OpenShift has a solution as well. Yeah, so we're still evaluating them and figuring out which one we should go. Because there are pros and cons to picking a platform. And once you pick, you kind of don't want to revert that decision, right? Because it's going to be painful to do that. I think, I think you, you, said, you seem to suggest that once you have a container, the container is the, container, the same everywhere, mm -hmm. uh, which is in fact not really true. Uh, I think if you will start evaluating Kubernetes, you will discover a lot of pain, especially in the area of networking, mm -hmm. because uh, the way how how the containers who can uh, see each other right. on Kubernetes is different from the way how they see each other right. when you do that like manual deployment. Right, right. Uh, they see each other on the local software basically. Um, if you put them on the same, I mean, it depends on how you... Yeah, if you put that, right. but I, I think what you just suggested, and that was like your thinking, mm -hmm. that you have like an application in one container, then engineers, and then the database potentially in another container, and then you run them together as a, as a single entity, uh, then you okay, and then when you want to do a cluster deployment, we will have those entities spread across, across clusters. Right. The, each entity will talk to its like right. usually on the local cluster. Right. So uh, what what I mean is that I think this is a kind of fallacy to believe mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. if you have Docker mm -hmm. uh, it would be the same on a on the Mesos swarm or Kubernetes mm. or Anything else? Yeah, actually, and like, okay, the difference between deploying here or <coughs> somewhere else is mm -hmm. of course much bigger than mm -hmm. the difference between running on Mesos or Kubernetes. In, mm -hmm. in our experience, uh, the, the moving to Kubernetes uh, actually uh, open our eyes to certain changes, and, mm -hmm. and the fact that actually the from the operational perspective. Uh, from the what perspective, sorry? Operational perspective. Right, right. The, the Docker is not that monolithic as you might think it is. Mm. What, what uh, scenarios did you have uh, in between six? Is it networking, like streaming? No, or no it's, not, it's not even streaming. Like streaming. If, you, if you have a multiple, multi, like what is used for microservices talking to each other, mm -hmm. you want to schedule them as a as a single entity, uh, you have it very different from the situation when when you schedule them on that. And one host, like when you have a say when you have a development system of just developers mm -hmm. locally develop that they'll set, and then you want to deploy it on a on a production cluster mm -hmm. hundreds of machines or the thousands of machines, mm -hmm. then it would be a bit different. Mm -hmm. And it, this it's the, the problem there is that you, you cannot or oh, like not that you cannot. Uh, it, it has complexity to, to make a reproducible build, yeah. so mm -hmm. that it would be the same on the just there on the developer. developer machine, the staging environment, and then the production. And I have a question: How do you manage your image, like your build image configuration? I think you can take this out. <laughs> As in, like, if you set up a configure, like if you set up an orchestration oh, cluster, the most important part is that your images are like configured by the environment.
switch a lot to environment like this and if you inject and if you think uh, with the uh, environment variables like if, you, if you if you if you of that yeah yeah of uh, course there's, 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 there's no problem that. then then it may add some manual work and this is what we would like to avoid not not manual work but uh, it, it adds some complexity to the development because you need to make sure okay, that yeah, everybody yeah, is aware yes, of it yes, yes. this is what I mean that right. yeah, definitely work. definitely right. but I mean back back to the point like I think if like so far as we're transitioning out and we're playing with different technologies so far we haven't hit any big um, issues like what you described. Maybe because of the nature of the way we develop the application or nature of our apps is a bit different. But I think it's definitely something to think of like, like just because something works on a single host doesn't mean that you will necessarily translate it into a cluster setup. Right. But uh, but but from my experience it's like if, if, if you do it in a certain way then maybe there's a higher chance for you to be able to, to, to do that. For us, uh, a primary focus is we want to get rid of developers requiring access to clusters. We want to make sure that a developer can just pull the images that were built by the CI/CD pipeline and take those exact image tags and run them on their machine and reproduce, um, you know, invite, like errors that they are getting in the cluster. Yeah, are you successful with that? Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know. I mean, we want to do. It's very different. Right? Well, I am certainly on my laptop, um, like reproducing production errors, uh, but developers are still accessing. Uh, I don't know how big it's going to be, how many developers you have probably. Um, I think about 30 or so. 30. Yeah. 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 Yeah